נעבור אל המשפחה שכבר ישובה בפינת הרעיונות שלנו. ובכן, מדי שנה בשנה, במשך 18 השנים האחרונות, אתם אורזים את המזוודות, משפחת אופק מירושלים, ההורים והילדים, ולוקחים את, כמובן גם את הילדים לחצי שנה לחיות בהודו. בן אדם נוסע לאיפה שטוב לו, לנו טוב בהודו. האווירה, הפשטות, החיים, הגישה האחרת לחיים. אנחנו פשוט חיים את החיים אחרת. אנחנו רוצים, לד... זה... אנחנו רוצים לדעת למה אנחנו חיים, ואנחנו הולכים לשם ומקבלים את התשובות. מה עם התשובות? <laughs> אנחנו כל כך סקרנים לשמוע כבר. <laughs> התשובות היא לא בדיוק מה לעשות, אלא איך לעשות. זו ראייה שונה של החיים בכלל. <laughs> ואתם התחתנתם והבאתם את יהונתן ויוהנה, שנמצאים גם הם באולפן. ערב טוב לכם. יוהנה, גם את מרגישה את אותה שלווה שאימא ואבא מדברים עליה? כן, גם. יונתן, החיים בכפר בהודו, חצי שנה בארץ, חצי שנה בכפר בהודו, זה לא מעבר חריף מדי עבורך? לא. מה אתה מצליח להוציא מתוך הכפר הזה? מה מוצא חן בעיניך שם? לי יש שם חברים. הרבה חברים, ויש שם נהל. יש שם חברים נולדתי למשפחה שנוסעת כל שנה לאשרם אננדה ואדי שבדרום הודו כדי ללמוד מגורו דב. גורו שהוריי האמינו שיוכל להביא אותנו להערה. כל שנה מהיום שנולדתי ועד הצבא גרתי חמישה חודשים באשרם. בגיל 12 ביקשתי מצלמת וידאו לבר מצווה, ובלי לשים לב התחלתי לתעד את החיים שלנו בישראל ובהודו. באשרם היו לי חברים מכל העולם. היינו ממציאים משחקים, רצים ומטפסים על עצים ואוכלים מהם מנגו וגויאבה. כל יום אחר הצהריים נפגשנו כדי לשחות בנהר. למדנו אומנות לחימה הודית, ובלילה היינו משחקים קלפים ומדברים. היינו חופשיים. בזמנים שונים היינו כ-40 ילדים משם, והם היו כמו אחים ואחיות שלי. ב-73 הייתה מלחמה, שבלית ברירה השתתפתי בה, וכשעברנו את התעלה, הייתה עלינו הפגזה של קטיושות. ראיתי על המשאית למעלה, וראיתי שרכב שמאל שלי רועדת. רועדת מפחד. ברגע שהייתי מודע לכך שהרכב רועדת מפחד, עצמתי את העיניים. עשיתי קפיצת הדרך להודו, ראיתי אותו, נרגעתי, וכל היתר זה היה משחק של ילדים אחרים סביבי. כשהוא אומר, without me nothing is, זה בעצם משפט שקרישנה היה אומר. אני חושב, אני אפילו לא יודע. without me nothing is, זאת אומרת, בלי, בלעדיו שום דבר לא קיים. אז זה לא בלעדיו כאדם, זה משולב של בן אדם שהוא אל. להורים היו שתי שיחות ביום, שעה בבוקר, שעה וחצי אחר הצהריים. בתור הקטנטנים הייתה מטפלת, תמיד, אישית. כש... 
כשגדלנו היינו כובשים. ואז היינו מסתובבים, מסתובבים בש... בשכונה, בכפרון. <laughs> אני חושבת שהיה תקופה גם שהם ניסו לעשות תורנות תדרים, אבל זה לא עבד להם. ההורים <laughs> 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 לא רצו להפסיד. <laughs> מי שחי שם, חי בתוך מין בועה כזו של הרבה הרבה פחות התחבטויות יומיומיות והחלטות, וכאילו זה מאוד פשוט. יש סדר יום, קמים בבוקר, הולכים לנהר, הולכים לעתוק, הולכים לזה, זה מאוד מובנה, אין לי יותר מדי עם מה להתעסק. שקט, זה, זה מאוד שקט לחיות ככה. מה הפעם הראשונה שהגעת לעוד ומה היה? מעלים. את מדברת על הודו או על הכפר? אין בשבילי הבדל בין הודו והכפר, הודו בשבילי זה הכפר. אוקיי. אבל אני לא, לא... זאת אומרת, אני מאוד מוגבלת במה שאני ארצה לדבר, האמת. למה? כי זו חוויה מאוד פרטית, ולא חוויה בשביל אחר לשמוע, כי הוא לא מסוגל לשמוע כמו מה שאני אומרת. זה נקרא דרשן טריה. בסנסקריט, זה אתה לא אומר משהו שהשני לא יכול להבין. אם מישהו לא היה בחוויה כזאת, הוא לא יכול להבין. מה היה כשפגשת את גור עודד בפעם הראשונה? הגעת וידעת שהוא המורה שלך? כן. מתי? כשראיתי צילום שלו בפריז. אז לפני שהגעת. כן. מה, הצילום ידעת שהוא המורה רק על פי תמונה? ממש לא. ממש לא. כשאני מדברת על המורה שלי, אני מדברת בזהירות מאוד גדולה. למה? כי הוא המורה שלי. אוקיי. וזה הדבר הכי יקר לי. אתה מדבר כאילו שזה בן אדם. מורה הוא לא בן אדם, מורה הוא מורה. מה הוא אם הוא לא בן אדם? מורה. הוא לא בן אדם? כשהוא מורה הוא לא בן אדם. אתה לפחות לא יכול להתייחס אליו כמו אל בן אדם. זו התייחסות לא נכונה. אבל בן אדם. בשיחות היו שואלים את גור עודב מה משמעות החיים, והוא היה עונה שאנחנו כאן כדי להבין את האמת. והאמת היא שאתה לא הגוף שלך, אתה לא המוח שלך, אתה אושר אינסופי, שמחה, אהבה וידע טהור. הדרך היחידה להתעורר מהאשליה ולהיזכר בטבע האמיתי שלך היא בהדרכה של גור האמיתי. כל שנה כשחזרנו מהודו לישראל, אסור היה לי לספר לאף אחד שום דבר על האשמה. לא לחברים, לא למשפחה ולא למורים. אמרו לי שכדי להגן על עצמי אסור לי לספר. כששאלו אותי בבית ספר למה אני נוסע להודו, לאורך השנים המצאתי הרבה סיפורים. שלאבא שלי יש מסעדות בהודו, שאנחנו נוסעים לקנות תבלינים, ושיש לי סבא הודי. בגיל 21 סיימתי צבא, התחלתי ללמוד קולנוע ולא חזרתי יותר לאשרם. בגיל 28 עזבתי את ירושלים ועברתי לגור בתל אביב. עבדתי כצלם והתחלתי טיפול פסיכולוגי שנמשך שבע שנים. הטיפול עזר לי המון, אבל היו דברים שלא הצלחתי לדבר עליהם. 
ובאיזשהו שלב פסיכולוג שלי התחיל לרמוז שאולי כדאי שאעשה סרט על הילדות שלי באשרם. באשרם גדלו איתי עוד כ-40 ילדים. לא שמרתי איתם על קשר ב-20 השנים האחרונות. עם הזמן, כשלא מדברים, גם הזיכרון מתחיל להיעלם. Look, we, if you, you know, if you agree, first of all, I'd be super happy if you agree to be in this. And of course, you don't, we don't have to f film your kids or family or, or we don't even have to show your house. I mean, it's, it's up, to, everything is okay. It's up to you. So. Uh, no, it, it's just, it's, I'm not involved. I don't talk to people about it. It's not a part of my life anymore. You know, until I got the message from you, it's something I don't really think about very much. But, um, you know, my mom still goes. So my way is just sort of like, she wants to do it. She, she can keep going. We just don't talk about it. I'm, don't, I'm not sure I, I have the courage to do what you're asking. It makes me so emotional. It makes me very anxious to the point where I'll be sick. You know, it'll hurt my stomach and I'll be sick. החימו זה דבר די דוחה. גם מאוד מעייף. מה זה? פשוט מאוד מעייף הטיפולים. חשבתי לבוא לקפל פה ולבקר אותך עוד שבועיים. וואו. ג'ו, עוד שבועיים זה האחרון. אם הייתי פה, הכל בסדר. באמת שלא טוב. אני יכולה לשלוח לך משהו מפה מארצות הברית? אולי ריסוס פיסס. סבבה. סוכר להאכיל את המחלה. תגיד, ואתה עושה איזה שינוי בחיים? שינוי נפשי, כאילו, בשביל לטפל בסרטן מהצד הזה שלו? השינוי הוא בזה שאני עושה את הסרט הזה. אבל אז קיבלתי סרטן בבטן. אז אני לא יודע אם זה היה רעיון כל כך טוב. <laughs> בגדול אני ממשיך לפתוח דברים ולדבר על הכל. אני מקווה שזה לא יהרוג אותי. תשמע. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't heard from you in so long. I'm yeah. so happy that you agreed to be in my film. I'm happy to talk. I'm happy... I think I want to, to get the reflection, to know that this happened. We had such a crazy childhood over there. Was I imagining it? You know, was I in a mental institution um, hallucinating that this happened? Because it's so strange. M maybe, but when there are other people, I can, I can verify that, no, this happened. בדיקות דם, הכל, הכל בסדר. וואו, זה נהדר. הוא אמר שאני... 
כן, שאני יכול לטוס בראש שקט, והוא קבע לי לעוד חצי שנה הפעם. יופי, אני ממש שמחה לשמוע. נהדר. נהדר לשמוע שהבדיקות כולם בסדר. מרגיע. בעניין הסרט, אני מוטרדת מאוד על זה, כי אני חושבת ש... קצת טעיתי שלא אמרתי לך מההתחלה שאי אפשר לעשות סרט על עוד. טעות, לא... לא... לא שמרתי עליך בצורה הנכונה. לא לצלם עצמך להגיד. תפתחי את הפה. כנראה שזה דבר לא טוב בשבילך, לא טוב בשביל כולנו. מה זאת אומרת? אין רשות לעשות את הסרט הזה. כולם הולכים לנסות לשכנע את כל הילדים שלהם לא להתראיין. אבל זה חמור, יונתן. זה מאוד חמור. אני לא, לא יכולה להופיע בכלל בסרט שלך. You know when you're looking for something? And you don't see it? Yeah. But you know it's there? Yeah. They're right in front of your eyes. And... That's, that's when you, you turn your back and give it a chance to be there. And then there it is. A glitch in the matrix. Yeah. <laughs> Step one is to get some curry leaves. Okay. Good one. Okay. Yeah. Now, you stir it, let it toast, stir it, and somehow it turns into poti. When we moved to India, I remember they're telling me that we're going to leave, and I had the last soccer game, and, you know, I was eight. But I still remember that soccer game. It was my last kind of what I would consider normal American day. You had the orange slices at halftime, the Kool-Aid. When we moved to India, it was so different. I was there for a long time, near like 15 years. But what did they But tell your parents? Sorry, what did they tell you when you were going there? We're moving to India. For what? Yeah, I don't know if they even explained it. Um, I remember jumping off of moving trucks. Uh, remember the sand trucks? Yeah, jumping onto them. Um, uh, jumping into them from walls above them as they yeah. drove past. All sorts of stupid stuff we did. We're always injured. Yeah. Do you believe in the philosophy we were taught? To me, it was an immediate questioning of the authorities, basically, was you learn that you don't need objects to, be happy, to have happiness. But if you remember the, the gold Rolex that he wore, yeah. um, the perfumes that his daughters would wear, and the silk saris and gold everywhere, I always thought, well, that doesn't make any sense at all because you're saying one thing and doing another. So very early, I, I just, I was really bad at uh, mm -hmm. sitting in that room. I mean, you, you appeared to me like, I'm sorry, this is a detour, but you appeared to me like a, like a really, really good disciple. You know, like the holy yeah. kid trying, you know, his best and really, and that was what you, 
I mean, that that's what I got from you. That's what I, I wanted guess. to be, yeah, yeah, sure. You want to be a good kid? I remember the last probably four years I was there, I never prostrated. I was just there. I leave, stand in the back, just make an appearance. Oh, you're a courageous kid. No, it was oh. easy then because if you wait, it, it was it was rushed, and if you waited too long, he could just leave. Yeah. And so I always managed to wait till he was gonna leave, and then people would even throw themselves on the ground when his back was turned. But I I just I just thought uh, you know I had to make that appearance, and then I was free. I remember when I left. He asked me who I was, <laughs> and somebody said, Steve's son. And I thought, that's odd. I've been here like 15 years. <laughs> but I think that sums up my relationship with him. I, I lived outside of uh, his vision. Yeah. It's like we grew up in two different places. I never even thought about the possibility of not believing. I do remember feeling like we were looking after each other. We were raising each other, sharing wisdom and knowledge and ways to get away with things and ways to make things easy. Um, we had our own culture as children because the adults were gone. הטלפונים שאני מקבלת כבר מגיעים למצב בלתי נסבל, והיום, מה שאמרו לי היום זה, אם יונתן יעשה את הסרט, אם אני לא עוצרת אותך, כל המשפחה שלנו תיהרס. All your family will be destroyed. לא עומדת בזה יותר. שאת, גם ככה את לא יכולה ל... <coughs> את לא יכולה להגיד לי מה לעשות, נכון? אז כאילו... <coughs> אז שתגידי להם את זה. את לא שולטת בי, זה לא... זה לא החלטה שלך. אם יש להם בעיות, שיתקשרו אליי. זהו. שלא ידברו איתך יותר. וואו. <laughs> 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 good. Good. You? A bit Good. tired, though. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I imagine. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, like... My mom and I went there to live when I was six. So pretty much my whole childhood was in India. Everybody who knows me knows that I grew up in India, and they actually think it's, they actually, they, they like it. You know, they, 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 that's sort of my identity to them. It is. So people um, do know. Yeah. Okay. I mean, well, they don't know about Anandavadi, but they know that I grew up in India. Um, but, you know, I, like yeah, I said, I, yeah, I tell them that I, that I, my dad worked as an English teacher there, which is, I, I tell them that because it's, it's not, it's not a lie. It's, it's the truth. It's, it's only part of the truth. Do you say the word ashram or just India? India. I just say India. Um, I tell them I grew up in a village in India. And, yeah, and, so it's uh, definitely, there's a yeah. coolness to it. Yeah. The only time I've ever, it's ever gotten kind of awkward is, is when they've asked me why my dad uh, got a job in India, of all places. Um, and I just tell them I, I, I don't know. Uh, I just tell them I never asked, I, I never asked him that. attended the talks, you know, from the age of nine. I wasn't at all there against my will. I was very interested in the spiritual, even at a young age. I never felt like I wasn't devoted enough. Uh, but, um, 
but I thought that, you know, I basically thought good thing, it's a good thing I am because if I, if I ever one day lost my devotion, then, I, then bad things would happen to me. And I also remember stories about people who had been disciples in the past who left and, and uh, decided not to come back and, and who decided that this, you know, Ananda body wasn't for them and that bad things later happened to these people or like they got in accidents or, you know, they had, they, they, they got, you know, divorces or lost their job or whatever. for a purpose for people who are seeking the spiritual and go there for it. I just, I, I just think it's okay to listen to everyone and decide for our own. I don't think that, you know... I would hate... It will be... It will hurt you to do something that hurts somebody. I... That is, that is another problem. But for myself, as a disciple, I would, I would do anything I could stop you. I really? don't think it can have a good outcome. I just don't. It will hurt you. All right. Have a good day. Good Take care. You too. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye. I think that it's possible that there's certain um, aspects of the way that Ananda body is run by disciples that makes it cult-like but I don't think it actually is a cult. The mental control through fear, uh, if you talk to anybody else outside of the ashram, bad things might happen to you. Don't question certain things. Um, rituals have their place in religion, but when once it becomes something that people obsess over and people are judged over, that seems like a cult to me. So um, that's why I think that the best thing, at least for me, to do is to separate the basic teaching. If the basic teachings speak to me, which they do, then to separate that from everything else. You know, I have Grudeau's picture. I, I don't have it out because, you know, Rebecca comes over. I you know, mentioned that I don't, haven't told her about it yet. And um, so because of that, I, I keep it. In, in a drawer. Can you show us the picture? Yeah. <clears throat> what does it raise in you when you see the picture as well? Just uh, somebody experiencing pure joy. I see, I mean, I see this and I see pure joy. And, and happiness. Um, and it, it makes me feel uh, clear inside, I guess, is the best way to, um, yeah. a little bit of a void because for so long I just couldn't share it with anybody. Hey. Good morning. <laughs> Good morning. <laughs> How's it going? Being told that you couldn't talk about it, being told that you needed to lie about where you were over the summer, um, you know, you couldn't tell people about anything that went on over there. Um, you know, the secrecy, the secrecy around it, was there someone you felt you could share anything with? No, I think we were taught that we couldn't share it. Mm -hmm. 
And so I didn't, I was a child, I didn't know, I didn't know any better. Oh, there were all these rituals that were all terrible. Um, it started really early, but it would start with a guru bathing in the river that people got up for and for some reason wanted to attend like this was a holy moment. Um, then you had the greeting where you prostrate yourself in front of the guru and if you touched his feet, you were lucky. Like people cried for that, which, uh, so weird. I remember the shoot him and the ah shoot him. That sort of ruled our life. Basically, if you had showered and your clothes were clean, you were con considered shoot him. If you touched anything that was dirty from like a kernel of rice or uh, a thread, I think we were super paranoid about threads, um, that uncleanliness, the ashudam, would transmit to you. It started from the age of five. You had to plunge in the river, ideally three times, and then you fill a sprinkling can with river water, and uh, you sprinkle everything when you come back from the river to your apartment. You sprinkle everything in your apartment, um, we had like a Bible of what could, what materials would transmit cleanliness and uncleanliness. So we would have like steel tongs that we would have to like lift clothes up with. You know, if you touched a wood bed frame, like that would transmit. To you, you had to be very, very careful. You know. Oh man, yeah, that was that was a rough one. If you slept in your bed, your bed was Ashuram. You yeah. would wake up Ashuram. Yeah. You couldn't touch your bed. You yeah. <laughs> yeah. What was it for? Oh, I have no idea. Any sort of rules or discipline that can be enforced are a mechanism for control. But maybe, I mean, really I'm trying to, you know, I, I in my life I usually try to kind of think what I can take from that. Yep. And, and I'm thinking maybe it, it gives you a sort of a awareness to your walking around. I can feel that it's stone, so I, I'm more aware of different materials. Maybe there's a use to that. I do not think there's any good takeaway from that, from, from the cleanliness rule. I mean, I'm super paranoid about, like, spilled water and stuff now <laughs> in my life. Why? Because water was one of those things that, you know, if you got splashed by a drop while drinking, um, you know, that changed your status. And, you know, you'd have to go through this elaborate ritual to get that status back. Yeah, I mean, you know, <laughs> we were in a cult. I don't know, what do you think? Uh, I think so. <laughs> yeah. I guess so. I mean, there's no real guessing about it. Like, when you, when you think about it, when you look at the methods of the whole method or the whole setup there, like, what was being achieved? What was going on? You know, you were on such ceremony. Everybody around him was so... Uh, devoted, I guess is the right word. It felt very, very scary, right? What if you did something wrong? What if you said the wrong thing? You were taught that this person had all the answers and could see through your soul, you know? You know what, M maybe it was a cult, but maybe it was just the people around him that made it a cult. And maybe he, maybe he was enlightened. Maybe he could see through our souls but you can abstract, you are aware that you were basically programmed to believe that, right? What do you mean? You're being told that this is the path, this is the way, this is the way, this is the way. You know, you were told this when you were one, two, three, four, five, six. Like, you're, you are going against part of yourself, right? 
do you think that spiritual understanding should cause fear? No. Why should this cause you fear? parents were looking at me as a very bad influence and a very bad kid who was leading their kids astray. I could bring all sorts of Western evils to the, the purity of the ashram. And I did that. I did that by bringing science fiction books, for example. Um, I remember getting in trouble for letting, you know, Tim uh, and David read certain science fiction books. There was even one time when David's mother had a book burning and burned a bunch of books because she realized just how evil they were, these science fiction books. The idea was that if all the kids just grew up on the ashram and stayed on the ashram, no one needed, what do you need school for? What is there to know that you can learn in school that is of any value in comparison to the absolute truth that is being offered you right here at the guru's feet. So why go, why should, it, especially a girl, why should a girl go to school? There's no, it's just, it's the most pointless thing on earth. When did you first hug your mother in the morning? Um, I don't remember hugging my mother in the mornings in India. I don't remember doing it in the evening either. And I think we, when we were really young, we would go to bed and she would go to leave taking. And she had to be shootum for leave taking. And I think we typically went to bed ashutam so she couldn't hug us because she couldn't show up at leave taking ashutam. After 
the window of period time when we had to stay shoot them, you know, we would almost always inevitably become a shoot them, right, as kids. Yeah. But our parents stayed shoot them through the day, right, for the most part, because they were going to the talks, the samadhis, right? Yeah. So they were the clean ones, we were the unclean ones. That was like the basic organizing principle, right? So on some core level, we were just the dirty, impure ones, yeah? When I quit going to Anandavadi, the last year I went, I was 16, and I was hollowed out. I had nothing inside. I had no internal resources. I had no confidence in myself and my own judgment. I was so self-doubting that when I got a job at a grocery store bagging groceries, worked there for 10 years. My boss suggested, why don't we move you up to cashier? I didn't think I could do it. And I said, please just let me stay a bagger. No one had ever given me any reason to believe in myself and in my own abilities. I had always been told that the, that the me I thought I was actually didn't exist. And I needed to find some way to shed it like a snake sheds its skin. About age 26, I decided I could perhaps take a stab at going to college, which was something I hadn't really tried. And so I, I took it very slowly. I took one class, and what do you know? I did, a, I did all right. Hi, Hannah. Hi, Rojan. Matthew. Salima. I had to build it brick by brick by brick, you know? That sense that, hey, wait, I can do stuff, you know? I'm capable. So I've gone from being uh, someone who was, you know, too terrified to be a cashier to someone who's um, uh, soon to publish a, a heavily researched book on ancient religion that I hope advances human knowledge and makes a contribution to, uh, to hi history and science. Theory of mind or mind reading. Now, let me just explain a little bit about uh, false beliefs and the tests that have been run to try to understand when is it that children are able to understand false beliefs. So apparently chimpanzees cannot understand false beliefs, but children, very young children can. Thank you very much. Is there time for any more questions? Or? Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. That's one thing for a 40-year-old adult to go seeking to sort of annihilate their ego, right? It's another thing to tell a five-year-old who's just beginning to have a sense of self, that that sense of self they're just beginning to develop is an illusion that needs to be wiped away. I mean, that to me is psychological murder of a child. <clears throat> what has been, uh, what have, I, I just mentioned a couple of the things that have been my, the, the, the keys, the, the doors through which I escaped from Anandavati. What has been your door no, I, or doors? I, I, I fell in love with someone. Uh -huh, uh -huh. I was 26 and got my heart broken. And, uh, was a guy, someone, <laughs> he. And uh, he broke my heart wonderfully. Didn't care about anything anymore. You didn't? Yeah. No. Nothing matters anymore, so. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Plus the fact that so he saw a picture of Gurudev in my room and said, who the fuck is this ugly person? And you mm. know, nothing mm. happened. So. Mm. The world didn't come to an end. Yeah. A thunderbolt didn't come and strike him dead. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I certainly thought that he could read my mind. I don't know if you felt the same way. Yeah. 
Did you think that Gurudev could see you from his picture? Yeah, <laughs> me too. I think we must have all felt that way, right? Like, I haven't pulled people, but I, it must be. It must be, because there used to be a picture like in the CRC or in the library, and mm -hmm. you know, we were always sort of afraid of it or. Mm -hmm. It was watching you. Yeah. You know? <laughs> I would hold, I used to hold my breath each time hmm. Gurdjieff was there, and then I started, I, re, I like distinctly remember doing it like in my living room in Israel. Hmm. I would, the, my parents had a picture of Gurdjieff like up in their room, and you could see it from the living room, and hmm. I would look at it and then hold my breath and, you know, kind of in respect or in awe of. Hmm. Uh, but what would he see that would be so bad, you know? Because you were you were trying to be a good disi disciple, right? I you was a, a good disciple, but then you get the sense that you're bad mm. something somehow. You get just growing up, you get a sense that you're bad. Mm -hmm. Something about you is bad. I don't know what it is. Isn't that remarkable that we so many of us come out of it with that? to shoot here in my house and uh, I'm, I'm actually I'm, I'm really I'm not feeling well I have a fever so I'll, I'll talk to you when I feel better um, I'm really sorry you, you came all this way here I brought some Israeli chocolates, so I oh, think no. that's a. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Cheese! Oh. <laughs> Cheese! Oh. <laughs> well, we gotta close the door over there. Uh, We're gonna let the dogs uh, yeah. oh. there we go. She loves her. <laughs> 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 Interesting talks. What do you have to say? Nothing. When I was a kid, whenever I had a problem, my mother told me that I was supposed to think of the guru and chant the mantra. And so that's what I did. It felt like my thoughts were always bad. I would think about things that the ashram thought was bad. Like it could be anything from like questioning the guru to having honestly what now I understand are normal thoughts like sexual feelings and thoughts and things like that. You know, I thought those were bad. And I would pray every night that I could change that. You say, Sadguru Shri Madatma Nanda Swarupam. It took me years and years and years to get to the point where I could stop chanting that automatically. Every time something bad happened in my life, 
all of a sudden I'd be going through my mind, Sadguru Sri Maratmananda Swarupam, Sadguru Sri Maratmananda Swarupam. As a little kid, like those kinds of concepts were too abstract for me to even register. But um, as a teenager, I understood it and I started to understand it. And I went through a period as a teenager where I really, I went to the talks and I listened and I learned and I learned everything that he had to say. People would ask, what is my purpose in life? And he would say, well, your purpose in life is to realize your own true nature, that you are not your body, you are not your mind. You are beyond time, space, and causality. You are pure knowledge, pure peace, pure love, true consciousness, pure consciousness. So the only way that you can come to this reality is through the guidance of a real guru. It is the seeker's job to find a real guru. And the seeker's job is to love and serve the real guru. And through that love, you will reach your own real nature. My whole life, I was raised with this intense fear of the guru. And that this had accomplished exactly the opposite. And that actually all I got from his teaching was fear. I was scared and that was it. And that, that it had, and that in fact, I had gotten a lot closer to love and truth and peace by breaking myself away from him. I came back to the ashram when I was 25 years old with the intent that I needed to tell the guru what I really thought. I was so intensely scared. I was shaking. I was sweating. I was like, I was horrified. I thought lightning was going to strike me down. It was going to come from the sky and strike me down. Who was I to stand in front of God and tell him that he was full of shit? And yet here I was, I was doing it because something in me made me do, I had to do it. What happened after? Lightning didn't strike me out of the sky. In fact, God was clueless. God couldn't register a single word I said. God couldn't remember who I was, couldn't remember who my mother was. And he got up and he walked away and I was like, Oh my God, this guy who I thought was this all powerful, omnipotent, omnipresent, all powerful guru, he's nothing. And how in the world could that have power over me? And everything that I was scared of was nothing more than a demented little old man. That's it, he was not God. He was a demented little old man and that's all he was and he had no power whatsoever. <laughs> it's hard, huh? I'm fine. I think it's kind of triggering for him, though. I know. I was listening to you. Mm hmm. Very good. So, listen, you need a hug? Definitely. Yeah. <laughs> So listen, I mean, you and me, we need to just take our power back because we don't have anything to be scared of anymore and nothing to take away our power anymore. I mean, we just need to take our power back and it's not about him anymore. He's nothing. Or do we need to just stop talking about it? No, it's just fear, you know. And there's no, and it's so, it's so liberating when you finally realize that there is absolutely nothing to be scared of anymore. It was all a huge lie. Can it be, can there be some truth to it? I don't know. Can it be, can it have been a real guru? I mean, the truth is, yes, we are love, we are peace, we are knowledge, but he didn't help us get there. All he did was put fear. 
What are you feeling right now? It's just fear. It's it's fear. like fear. Like lightning will strike you yeah, from the sky. Yeah, you know, it's not used to. Uh, I guess I'm not used to talking freely, like or saying something bad about. It. Really? Yeah. yeah. Maybe you haven't had to. You haven't ever been in a, a situation or environment where you felt safe enough to say what you really and truly, deep down, feel. Yeah. All... I don't think I can say something bad about the you, you can't. Just you can't say it. Yeah. Would rather. You don't want to. Okay. Not yeah. deal with it. Yeah, we, we don't have to say it. <laughs> It's too... It's too scary. Yeah. yeah. So when I, I think I was 16 or 17, and it was one of the talks, and I was sitting there to talk, and suddenly I had this thought, you know, what if Blue Devil asked our parents to drown all the children? What would they do? <laughs> what did you think he, they would do? I don't know, but it was terrifying. The lie was everything. When you went back to Israel, when I went back to the United States, we knew we had to protect this secret with lies, right? We had to make up stories to tell our friends and our, our other family members, right? I couldn't tell my teachers, I couldn't tell my friends. I know my mother was lying to her employers about what she was doing for part of the year. Is that not only are you split off from other people who are outsiders by this gulf because they're not part of the Anandavadi group. You're split off from your own insider fellows because you can never tell them what it is you're really thinking if you're having any doubts or if there's anything at all you're questioning, right? So even folks like us, when we get together, we can't really talk because I don't know what you're thinking about an Andavadi, and you don't know what I'm thinking about an Andavadi, and all we can talk about is the weather, you know? We can't be, in so we can't even be intimate yeah. with the only people that we can share this experience with. We can't be intimate with outsiders because they're not part of our in-group. We can't be intimate with each other because we don't want to reveal our true selves to one another. So it's the total death of all intimacy, even between siblings and between children and parents. Why between children and parents? Because you can't speak honestly to your parents. Uh. As you know, or your own siblings about how you may feel. Come on, then. Sorry, I'm sorry that we went, that you had to go through this, that we had to. I hadn't, I hadn't fully come to terms with that or thought that until now. <sighs> On some level, I had not had a mom, or I had lost my mom to the guru a long, long, long time ago, and it never got her back, you know? אתם הובאתם להודו, אוקיי? כן. אתם לא בחרתם להיות בהודו. אוקיי. 
רק מי שבוחר ופתוח לקבל מורה יכול להיכנס לזה. אתם לא. אתם באתם בגלל שאנחנו באנו, ההורים. Okay. לא בחרת בזה. זאת אומרת שלא היית מוכן ולא היה באותו רגע הצורך שלך, ולא יכול אולי להיות, או כן, בגילאים כאלה, לפתיחות כזאת שאתה רוצה מורה רוחני. אתה לא רצית. אני הבאתי אותך לשם. אוקיי. Okay. אז אם ככה, אז למה 20 שנה מהחיים שלי לא היה אכפת לך משום דבר שהוא קשור אליי, ורק היה אכפת לך מהדת שלך? מי אמר שלא קשור? זאת אומרת, איך אפשר... כל, אפשר... כל 20 שנה הראשונות של החיים שלי חייתי את ה... אני יודעת, אבל, אבל בגיל 16 או 18 לא יכולת להגיד אני לא רוצה? בגיל 16 או 18 לא יכולתי להגיד כלום. לא יכולת להגיד כלום. אני לא רוצה? אבל, לי... אבל יוהנה כן היה... אמרה. אחלה. יוהנה בגיל יוהנה, 16 אחלה. הלכה. יופי, מעולה. אבל בן אדם בגיל 16 הוא בן אדם מבוגר. אה, כן? כן. אם שוטפים לו את המוח מגיל אפס, שאם הוא יגיד משהו לי. רע על הגור הוא ימות? <coughs> שמה? שאם הוא יגיד, יחשוב משהו רע על הגור הוא ימות? את יודעת מה הגימיק של כל הדתות, של כל הזה, לא גימיק, מה השיטה לא של דת. כל הזה? זה לא דת. זה לא דת. אז תגדירי את זה, כי את רוצה לדבר על משהו, אבל אסור לקרוא לא, לזה לא, בשום מידה. איך... קאט, אוקיי? לא, לא דת, קאט. לא את קאט יודעת ו... מה השיטה של כל הקאטות? אני יודעת, אותך, כבר דיברנו על זה המון. לשכנע אותך שאתה חייב את הבן אדם הזה. את משוכנעת שאת חייבת את הבן אדם הזה כדי לחיות. לא. אז מה? לא, לא מסכימה איתך לגמרי, ואתה תיתן לי את המקום שאני לא מסכימה איתך. Okay. לגמרי. אני לא זה... חייתי בשום כת. Okay. בחיים שלי לא חייתי בשום כת. Uh-huh. הוא רודף הוא המורה הרוחניות שלי, והוא לא שכנע אותי לשום דבר. אני טעיתי בהרבה דברים, באיך לתרגם את מה שהוא רודף אומר. אני בהחלט טעיתי, ואני מבינה את זה. ואולי אתה הייתי במקור? במק... מה? אולי הטעות היא במקור. אתה יכול לחשוב ככה, אני לא. אני יודע שאת לא יכולה לחשוב ככה. לא, לא אני לא, לא שלא יכולה, אני לא רוצה. אני לא רוצה. זה כל השיחה שלנו. אני לא רוצה. אני לא רוצה. אני לא רוצה. אני לא רוצה. למה אתה בגיל כזה, שאני בן אדם מבוגר, כמעט זקן, אתה רוצה בגיל... לתקן את החיים שלי? כי, כי תמיד, יש לך, אה, תמיד יש לך תירוצים. ובגיל, לא בגיל, בשום גיל אחר לא היה אפשר. בגיל אחר לא היה אפשר בכלל... למה לא אתה בכלל... חושב שאני צריכה שאתה תציל אותי? א', מי אמר שאני מנסה להציל אותך? אתה אותו? מנסה להוציא אותי ממה שאתה קורא כת. אתה מנסה מאוד חזק להוציא אותי מזה. מה, מה שאתה קורא שזה כת. למה אתה צריך לשנות אותי? מה זה יעזור לך שאתה משנה אותי? שאלה מעולה. זאת שאלה מצוינת, האמת שהיא מאוד ממוקדת, זאת שאלה טובה, אני מסכימה. טוב, כיוון שכולנו עוד פה, אבא שב, אני אביא לך גם את הסלט, גם את הקבוצה וגם אפילו את הליוקי. שב. אני מאוד מקבל שכנראה אני אף פעם לא אשנה אותך, ושזה הדרך שלך. זה בסדר, הכל בסדר, גור דב הוא הגור שלך. אבל אתה צריך לקבל את זה בפנים, שאתה שלם עם זה שמישהו אחר, מישהו אחר, לא משנה אם זה אימא או אבא שלך, עושה דרכו. אבל את יודעת שהסיפור שלי... אין בעיה, אבל את יודעת שהסיפור שלי זה שנולדתי בתוך כת? הסיפור שלך הוא כזה, אני מבינה. אני מבינה. נולדתי וגדלתי ב-20 שנה, או שאני מבינה, ואני מאוד מצטערת שזה ככה. בשבילך, מאוד מצטערת. אני אהיה הונתן. נולדתי וגדלתי בתוך כת 21 שנה. לא יכולתי לדבר על זה עם אף אחד, וזה גרם לי להיות מאוד בודד. עברו 19 שנה מאז שביקרתי בכת בפעם האחרונה. אני לא נשוי. עדיין לא הייתי במערכת יחסים. 
עברתי שנים של טיפול פסיכולוגי. אני עובד על הסרט הזה כבר שש שנים. אני עדיין מנסה להפסיק להאמין. אני יודע שיום אחד אני אצליח. 